Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Angelo, who is the founder and chair of the World Rivers Organization, um, who is a, has a, a passionate environmentalist. Um, he's the former head of the BCIT Fish, Wildlife and yeah. Recreation uh, program. Um, Mark approached us last year <clears throat> about ho hosting World Rivers Day here at the museum and we agreed that this was the perfect spot um, to be Burnaby's World Rivers Day site. Um, so that event is happening at the end of September and so we're going to be working closely together on that event. And I'm also really pleased that he's agreed to come and give us a talk about um, environmental history, Deer Lake Brook, um, the importance of waterways in Burnaby as well as the history of, of World Rivers Day. Um, the, the creek here is something that not everyone knows that much about, including myself um, and the staff here at the museum. So we're, we're really pleased to sort of fill this uh, interpretive gap that we have. Because from what I understand, a lot of visitors um, do ask about the, the creek and the environmental history here. So um, thank you very much, Mark, for being thank here. You, Good to be here. Nice to see you. Uh, I love coming here. I've been coming here pretty much ever since it opened. Uh, and I just want to say, I think many of you, if not all of you, are interpreters or going this for this year. Is that correct? Oh, hi. And there's Gene Beaton, <laughs> one of my neighbors. That's, well, I just want to say, I think so highly of the work that uh, you'll be doing. Uh, my daughter worked here long ago as a volunteer, and her experience here at the village was amazing. She went on to get involved in, in public relations and now media relations, but she often thinks back to her years here when she was quite young and she felt she learned a lot in terms of communicating with people, in terms of feeling at ease. And I also think the messaging that you put forward when people come here, they learn so much about the history of Burnaby. And, and I think interpreting our history, uh, knowing where we came from, knowing what the past was like, I think it's important to be aware of things like that. And I think it, it helps you appreciate your community, the community we all live in, or many of us live in today. Uh, I think it helps you to appreciate it even more. Uh, so I think you do great work, and I'm sure you'll have a great year ahead of you. All right, well, I'm really, uh, uh, it's nice to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about a few things. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about uh, environmental history and the cultural significance of rivers. I've been asked to talk a little bit about the values of waterways, the history of Rivers Day, and then I'm going to come down to this particular creek, a creek, by the way, that I love. It's a very special waterway, and one of the most beautiful sections of Deer Lake Brook runs right through the village. All right, just to start off, Burnaby, in terms of its own history, has a really close link with water, with waterways. If you look at Burnaby in an aerial photo, it's really quite striking. The southern part of Burnaby runs right along the Fraser River, and all you have to do is walk along the Fraser River to feel the history there. You see the old boats, and so certainly for that part of Burnaby, the Fraser River had a big influence. And then you see the lakes, particularly Burnaby Lake and Deer Lake. Very, very special lakes. Uh, and even today, you go to the Hart House, you can feel what Burnaby and the Deer Lake area within Burnaby was like a century ago or 70 or 80 years ago. The Hart House, I think, was built in 1913. But you can just tell that it was this amazing lake with these beautiful country estates scattered around it. And back then, of course, Burnaby was considered a long way from Vancouver and how things have changed and that Burnaby is now really the geographical heart of Greater Vancouver. And then we have all the creeks and streams in our city. Dozens and dozens and dozens of them. You know, I just want to say, uh, in terms of waterways, creeks, streams, rivers, in a cumulative way, they've had a huge impact on British Columbia. If you look at historical settlement, settlement patterns for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, that usually took place along rivers. So rivers and streams have had a huge impact, I think, on how we think about water, about salmon, about wilderness. The other thing that I think is so special about Burnaby, I feel really fortunate to be able to talk to you about this beautiful little creek running behind us that is still open, still free-flowing, and generally pretty healthy. Because there are a lot of other urban areas in the lower mainland where that's simply not the case. A really good comparison is to look at Burnaby and compare it to Vancouver. 
Vancouver, 120 years ago, had 50 salmon-bearing streams within its boundaries. Today, they have two. The reason for that is that almost all those streams were put in a pipe and paved over, because back then, that was deemed to be the easiest thing and the cheapest thing from a development point of view. There was no thought given to the fact that these streams could contribute significantly to our quality of life. And then you just cross the border into Burnaby and it's a very different world. One of the reasons for that is that Burnaby, going back to 1972, has had an open water course policy. So in Burnaby, uh, there were many less streams that were put in a pipe, culverted, and paved over. Most of the streams that existed in Burnaby, about two-thirds of them that existed 120 years ago, are still there. They're still open. They're still free-flowing. So anyway, I just think that's a really interesting contrast. And my hope is, as development continues to sweep up the Fraser Valley, that other cities to the east, that they learn from Vancouver's experience and that they benefit from Burnaby's. So just the fact that we can sit here in the midst of this open area and talk about this beautiful little free-flowing creek behind us, that in itself, I think, is very special. And 100 years ago, that certainly wasn't guaranteed that that would be the case. All right, rivers have incredible values. All waterways, creeks, streams, rivers. They have great natural values, great cultural values, great recreational values. And they are also really important to our own goals and objectives from a sustainability perspective. Burnaby, I think, has done some really good work in terms of striving to be, quote, a sustainable city. And some would say those two don't go hand in hand. But still, Burnaby, I think, has made really good, really good strides at striving to be, quote, a sustainable city. And in my view, I take a really broad interpretation of sustainability. You know, I'd like to think in our community that there'll be decent job opportunities for young and old, that we'll have educational opportunities, that we'll have a range of housing, uh, that we'll have public transit, all of those things. But I also believe in a community like Burnaby, healthy streams is a really important part of sustainability. And really, streams, all rivers, are barometers of how we treat the environment. So if people use too much in the way of pesticide, or if they use too much in the way of fertilizer, or if an industry dumps toxic waste, it almost invariably ends up in a nearby river. So if you don't have healthy rivers and streams, then sustainability is just a term. It's not a practice. So there is that clear link in healthy streams, healthy waterways, a really important part of sustainability regardless of where we live. All right, a couple of words about the history of Rivers Day. And I'm thrilled that Burnaby Village is going to be a big participant this year. The biggest event in Burnaby will be right here. Uh, and given our proximity to Deer Lake Brook and everything too that the village represents from an historical perspective, this is a great place to have that amount. A lot of you know about Rivers Day. How many of you have heard about Rivers Day before? Most of you? All right, well, Rivers Day actually started in 1980. And just say a few words about it, because British Columbia and Burnaby has a tight connection. We started Rivers Day, the idea of BC Rivers Day back in 1980, with a cleanup we did on the Thompson River. It was a wonderful outing. It was small scale by today's standards, far fewer people than what we'll see here on September 29th. But we rounded up about 40 volunteers. We rounded up six rafts. And we went from, uh, we paddled down to Lytton. We went from Spencer's Bridge to Lytton in a day and just stopping at different beaches and picking up tons of garbage and debris and wire rope. Uh, we also worked with some towing companies to pull some old car wrecks off the rocks. It was really, it was really a great day. Small scale, but great day. And we had also approached the province about proclaiming that as Rivers Day, even though we only had one event and we got their agreement. So we thought we went to the Lytton pub that night and uh, the 40 of us were sitting there talking and it was so much fun. We said, let's do a few more of these events the next year and then the year after that. Well, anyway, slowly but surely, Rivers Day kind of took off and we started seeing events in communities around the province. And we got the province to buy onto it, but we thought, what can we do to take that, ne that next big jump? And at the time, this was still BC Rivers Day, so we wanted to take that next big jump so we thought, 
Well, we'll take a year approaching local governments around the province and ask them to proclaim BC Rivers Day. Well, the very first local government that we approached was the city of Burnaby. And the city of Burnaby agreed, and they passed it, they proclaimed it, and then that got the ball rolling. Then we approached cities around the province, and in a year, we got 90 local governments to formally proclaim it at a council meeting. And then, in 2004, 2003 was the International Year of Fresh Water, and in 2004, we heard that the United Nations wanted to establish a water for, um, uh, a decade focused on water, you know, where water would be a, kind of their key messaging, this water for life decade that would run from 2005 to 2015. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, gosh, something like a World Rivers Day would be a really nice fit with that. They had a World Water Day in March, but that focused on water in a much more generic way. So we thought the idea of a World Rivers Day in September, exactly six months later, would work really well. It would be really complimentary. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, we made a formal proposal to the United Nations and they embraced it. And in 2005, we celebrated our first World Rivers Day. And then World Rivers Day has taken off to the point where on September 29th, the year we have this celebration here, there'll be thousands of events going on around the world, millions of people. But to think that that event has its roots right here in British Columbia, I think is really neat. And to think that the city of Burnaby, right now I have a list of thousands and thousands of local and regional and state and national governments, you know, that have supported it. But other than, you know, the province of British Columbia at the provincial level, in terms of local governments, cities, municipalities, of the thousands and thousands and thousands that have proclaimed it by date, Burnaby is at the very top of the list, uh, the very first one. So I, I think there's that really neat connection. So it's fitting that we have a big event, at least one big event in Burnaby every year. And, I, and I'm so excited about this event and I'd like to think that uh, World Rivers Day may be taking place here for years to come, hopefully. All right, let's talk about Deer Lake Brook. Yes. <laughs> Very special little creek. I'm sure uh, for a lot of you, we were just saying, when people visit the village, you know, some may go up that way initially, but almost everyone, the vast majority, they come this way and they cross the bridge and the creek is the first thing they see. And I think it takes a lot of visitors by surprise. You know, they're not expecting it. And they stop on that bridge and they look up and down and say, wow, this is a really pretty little stream. But I want to talk a little bit about this stream. As I was saying, so many of your visitors come here. This is the first thing they see. A lot of them don't expect it. And I do think there is a great interpretive opportunity for this stream. This stream is a wonderful little creek. It is a short creek. You know, it's not even two kilometers long. It's a short, short stream. That said, it's very, very important. This little creek corridor has some amazing wildlife values. It would surprise you to know how extensive the wildlife values are here. It also has some very important fisheries values that we'll talk about. But also it serves an important, uh, plays an important role in terms of, of linkages, uh, migration corridors, things along those lines. You know, certainly in terms of fish moving up into the stream to either spawn here or carrying on up into Deer Lake, from a, a movement or migration point of view, it's very important. I've often sat at this bridge and seen animals come down to this creek. Probably all of you have seen raccoons come along. You've probably seen coyotes in here. Uh, songbirds coming and going, mink. I mean, you'd be amazed at the, you know, the, the animals that are uh, around here that, that utilize these corridors. One thing I love about Burnaby, Deer Lake Brook plays a really important role t from a migration point of view as a corridor in terms of natural habitat. But Burnaby as a whole, once again, I'll go back to that aerial map if you were to look at it or aerial photo. 25% of Burnaby is established as parkland. Most of its creeks and streams are open and free flowing and many of them run through ravines or have linear parks that go along them. And Burnaby has done a pretty good job in terms of linking the natural habitats or parks that we have in this city. You know, a few years ago, just to kind of experiment a bit, I was up at SFU and I walked off the mountain and I stayed in green and forest the whole time. Came down to the brunette, 
then up into Burnaby Lake. I'm still in green and forest the whole time. Came to the end of Burnaby Lake, then snaked my way over into Deer Lake, went across Deer Lake, across Royal Oak, and then that area to the west of Royal Oak is all natural park habitat too, and then snaked my way into Green Tree Village. So I had literally crossed the entire city, it took me several hours to do it, but I had crossed the entire city, and for almost my entire trip, I was in green forest because so many of our natural habitats, our parks are all linked. A lot of them are linked by streams or stream corridors like this one. But, but you know, if you look at Burnaby, 25% is parkland and the fact that they are for the most part all linked in terms of animals moving back and forth, it makes it much more viable than would be the case if all of those parks were totally isolated. And you had animals having to cross, you know, kilometers of developed space and malls and everything else. So, so that's another really neat, special thing about, about Burnaby. Anyway, back to Deer Lake Brook. A little bit about the history of this creek. We've been involved in the restoration and enhancement of this stream for many, many years. Uh, just to give you some examples, how many of you have seen the upper part of Deer Lake Brook where it runs out of Deer Lake? You know, there's that beautiful section of stream that runs out of Deer Lake and that little park and lawn area that leads down to it. It's close to the Hart House. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that 20 years ago, that was a private property. There was a house there and it was fenced off and that house owned the land on both sides of the creek. So this beautiful outlet of the stream was in effect blocked off to the public. Well, we thought if there was ever a chance to acquire that, I was with the Burnaby, the Environment uh, and Waste Management Committee at the time. We thought if there was ever a chance to acquire it, that would be a great opportunity in terms of protecting that habitat, enhancing it. Well, to make a long story short, that house came up for sale back then. And we looked at it and I remember seeing it like 40 years ago when Kath and I were first together, Gene. I remember seeing that house and thought, gosh, if that ever came for sale, I'd love to live there. But uh, anyway, we ended up moving uh, not too far from there. We lived fairly close to here. And, but I kept my eye on that property. And when it came for sale, we did a presentation to council. And council reacted very, very positively. And Burnaby had a little bit of an acquisition pot, you know, money they would set aside a little bit every year so that they could acquire key habitats when they came for sale. And uh, anyway, once staff heard about it, they thought, gosh, that's a great opportunity. To make a long story short, they made an offer on the house, they bought it, they took the house down, they re-landscaped the area, and since then we've done some enhancement work in there. We actually released shortly after that a lot of gravel into the upper part of the creek to enhance spawning terrain for fish. And a lot of people go in there now and they walk down that sweeping kind of lawn down towards the creek. and and they admire its beauty, but they aren't fully aware that it was only 20 years ago that they couldn't even go in there. Uh, but now, not only is it in the city's hands, but I'm quite confident that that area, which has some really important fisheries habitat, by the way, that that will forever be protected. Another example, uh, we got a grant about almost 20 years ago from a, a program called the Urban Salmon Habitat Program. And we used that to take down a small dam that existed right at the outlet of this creek where it hits Burnaby Lake. It was a dam about this high. And it was put there to keep coarse fish, i.e. carp, from moving from Burnaby Lake into Deer Lake. But the dam had, wasn't doing any good because there were already carp in Deer Lake. <laughs> there are carp in both lakes, some huge carp, by the way. So we looked at this dam, one, it wasn't serving its purpose, but secondly, it was an obstacle to the movement of salmon and other fish who wanted to move into the creek and up the creek or down, well, it wasn't so much an obstacle to fish moving down because they just go over the spillway, but it was an opt obstacle to fish moving up. It wasn't that tall, but on the other side of it, it was really shallow. There was really no place where fish could get a run up and get over that. It was, uh, it was really difficult. So anyway, uh, it was a useless dam, had outlived its purpose or served no purpose at all. We got the grant to take it down. And then all of a sudden with that dam gone, the potential to get anadromous fish or the movement of fish from Burnaby Lake up or salmon that came from the Fraser to the Brunette River into Burnaby Lake, up Deer Lake Brook, 
They could spawn here or they could move into Deer Lake and then spawn in some of the other little creeks that run into Deer Lake, like Buckingham Creek. All of that became viable. So removing that dam was a huge, huge step forward. Another thing we've worked on is to try, over the years is to try and reestablish riparian habitat. You know, certainly uh, things are better now up at the outlet than they used to be. They're in pretty good shape along here. You know, protecting riparian habitat, one of the challenges here too will be removing things like non-native vegetation, you know, that there, a lot of creeks and streams have issues with. Uh, things like Japanese knotweed or bamboo or ivy or whatever. But still, you've got pretty decent, you know, riparian habitat in place here. But elsewhere on the creek, there are sections farther down where we've tried to enhance that a little bit over the years. Now, from an interpretive point of view, you'd come here and you'd say, gosh, look at all this riparian habitat, and you'd have to explain that, i.e. streamside habitat. But a visitor might say, well, what good does that do? Well, the bottom line is that streamside vegetation plays a really important role. It's essential to the health of a, a small stream, especially. One, it helps to filter out pollutants. You know, so the, the more natural vegetation, any kind of pollution has to work its way through, at least you've got a chance of filtering out some of it. It stabilizes the stream bank. That's a pretty steep stream bank. If there was no vegetation on it, that bank would not be nearly as stable and you'd run the risk of soil sloughing off into the creek. Another thing, all this vegetation here, and I'll talk about this a little later, but this little creek has lots of insects in it. Very important. A lot of those insects, some of them are bred in water, reproducing water, but a lot of them drop off the vegetation here. They'll drop off leaves, a wind blast will come. And so vegetation in terms of providing a source of insects to fish, that too is really important. And last but not least, this part of the creek is in shade a lot. For all of you that have been here in the midst of summer, you look at this and say, this creek's in shade, and that's not a bad thing. So from a temperature point of view, what do you think the vegetation does? Moderates it. It helps to keep temperatures, water temperatures down. Because, you know, uh, in a lot of creeks that don't have that, if you have a really hot summer and there's no vegetation to shade it, some of those streams warm up incredibly. And if you get a, a stream like this, if it were to warm up towards 20 degrees or more, then that's really stressful for fish. So. Vegetation, streamside vegetation, really important, plays a lot of roles. And once again, just something to be aware of. In terms of fish, there's a lot more fish in this creek than a lot of people realize. You have resident fish in this creek. You have cutthroat trout. You have rainbow trout. Now, the rainbow trout are primarily in the top end. You know, the lake up there is stocked with rainbow trout once a year. And some of those trout will come in up to the top end but you have cutthroat trout in here. You have chum salmon in this creek. You have coho salmon. Last year, one of the most exciting things for me, um, you know, I've monitored the, how many fish we get in here. Ever since we took the dam down, we've been trying to monitor how many fish we get in here. And you know, every couple of years, we see a couple of coho, and I thought, well, you know, we've got some fish in here. But last year was the first year we had a big run of fish in here. And, uh, and that was so exciting. And a lot of these fish either spawned in this creek. And uh, by the way, a lot of creeks and streams in Burnaby had fish in them last year. Gosh, Still Creek, we had our first big salmon run in Still Creek in 90 years. I mean, that was really, really exciting. But then you had fish, you know, they'd come up over the fish ladder into Burnaby Lake. Some would head up to Still Creek. Um, uh, some would, and then quite a few actually, then would come up into to Deer Lake Brook, but either they'd spawn here or they'd use this as a migration corridor. And if you followed this creek up to Deer Lake, and then you bared left and you walked down kind of towards where the beach area is and the parking lot, there's a little creek there called Buckingham Creek. It's a really small stream, you know, it's no bigger than this walk, smaller than this walkway, and it's fenced about 10 feet off the creek just to protect the vegetation and keep people from swimming in that little creek. But it was chocker block full of chum salmon. And it was so neat on a Saturday to go down there and see hundreds and hundreds of kids and families. And they're looking at these fish. And 
you know, and a lot of these, the, the children I met, this was November, had just learned about the salmon life cycle, and here they were, <laughs> right close to their home in their backyard, seeing it all play out for real. Uh, so I thought that was a really, really special time, and rightfully so. There was a lot of press, TV coverage. You can still find some stuff online, uh, but it, uh, yeah, I just thought it was really, really very, very special. Let me talk a little bit about the life cycle of fish, just so you know. The trout I mentioned, cutthroat trout and rainbow trout, they're resident fish. They're here all the time. They spawn in the spring. They don't spawn until they're probably three years old. They probably live to be eight years old. Some would say maybe nine or ten in a max way, you know, but that might be pushing it. But anyway, they are resident fish. And then we have our chum salmon that came in here and spawned. They spawned in November, and those eggs hatched in February, but they spent a month as what we call elvins. Uh, some, some call them yolk fry, but they're, they're really little, and they're still attached to the egg, and they actually feed off their egg for a month. And then once the egg dissolves, then they become fry, and the chum move out of here pretty quickly. They don't stay in the creek a whole long time. They move out fairly quickly and head their way down to the estuary. Whereas the coho that spawned here, same thing, they spawned, I actually saw the last coho spawn after the chum, but the coho spawned in mid to late uh, November. Same thing, you know, they, they hatched as elvins for a month, then they become fry, but the coho will probably spend a year. Sometimes you find situations where they spend longer, but they'll probably spend a year here. They'll get a little bigger and a little bigger. And then once they become smolts, that's something inside that triggers them to say, hey, it's time to go to the ocean, and then they leave, and they swim down to the estuary. But all these fish have different life cycles. But you've got your main difference between your trout that are resident, and then the salmon or anadromous fish, or they're fish that, that are born here and will then come back here to die. And some of them, like the coho, will spend a bit of time in their early year, that first year, actually rearing here. Another thing I'll, I'll just quickly say, a lot of people are always focused on the bigger animals and the fish on a creek like this. But another thing it might be worth saying, a really important aspect of this creek is how productive it is for all those little critters that you can't see that are really, really important. They're what we call invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. They're really, really little guys. And basically, invertebrates tend to do well in streams that have good dissolved oxygen levels. There's lots of dissolved oxygen here because every time a creek ripples, that injects oxygen into the water. It's relatively clean, this water. It's, uh, and it's got decent nutrients. You know, it's, uh, so it's nutrient rich. So there's a lot of things going for this creek in terms of cultivating the little critters, the invertebrates that are so important. The reason being that basically that's what the bigger fish that you do see, that's what they're feeding on. Those little fry, once they become elvins and they finish feeding off their yolk sac and they become fry, well, they seek out zooplankton. And those are really little microscopic guys, but that's what feeds the little guys. Then as they get bigger, and the trout certainly will live in here for several years, but even the coho, if they rear here for a year, then they start to seek out other food. Things like mayflies, or stoneflies, or, or worms, or mollusks. All of those you can classify in the invertebrate envelope, but they're really, really important because without that, without an abundance of life at that level, then you're not gonna have an abundance of fish. So a lot of people forget there's an important linkage there. Anyway, the last thing I wanna say, I, I think that streams like this play such an important role environmentally in our community, but they also add greatly to the quality of life that we all enjoy. I love the fact that we live in a community and almost wherever you live in Burnaby, there is an open, free-flowing, attractive stream very close to you. So I think they contribute greatly to what this community is all about. They've contributed greatly to our history over the years, and uh, I think uh, Anything we can do to properly care for them, to look after them, that's what we should be doing. Nice. So in a nutshell, that's what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Very impressive. Can I ask oh. a question? Sure. From time to time, we get little kids coming in here with fishing rods. 
Whose jurisdiction is that, and what, are, what should be done on behalf of the village to look after that situation? Yeah, that's the, the province's role, the provincial government, you know, and they have regulations for each creek and stream. I know exactly what you said. Uh, Little Creek that I've worked on a lot is Gishon Creek. Some of you may have heard it. We've really worked at trying to restore that uh, for years and years and years, and we finally made great headway, and we've got a really healthy fishery population in there. But as more people hear about that, there's an interest in saying, oh, well, can I go and fish there? And, uh, one, you're a little different here in that you have control over this stretch of creek from an access point of view. Well, we don't because they come right down the creek. Well, oh. Uh, but the minute they do, we decide Well, that's what I'm saying. Are, yeah. are we allowed to stop them from doing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, well, it's your property. So, yeah. okay. you know, so you do have, uh, you do have some control there. Also, uh, uh, you know, the province, uh, you know, a lot of these smaller streams are, are closed to fishing. And uh, so checking your regs and everything else, but because of the nature of the creek here and the control you have on it, it's probably a lot easier for you, for the village to stop something like that than it is elsewhere. Yeah. I have two questions. So the temporary question is, what's the amphibian health like that you here, and are the turtles native? I don't know where, but I see Well, the turtles you get, the red-eared sliders are not. They were released as, the Western Painted Turtle, uh, and actually one of the better places to see them, Western Painted Turtle, is at the very bottom end of Deer Lake Brook, you know, where you get close to Burnaby Lake. Those are native? Yeah, those are considered to be native. Some, you know, I noticed when uh, there was this big debate between the province and the city over the dredging of the lake, some tried to make the point that Western Painted Turtles may have inadvertently been introduced themselves 150 years ago or whatever. But, you know, I. From my perspective, I look at the western painted turtle as indigenous to this area. I look at the red-eared sliders as not indigenous. And then the amphibian element frog and sound that makes Yeah, yeah, there's more, once again, more of that than you would think. Uh, amphibians are threatened in so much of the world. You know, I, I don't think we've got the populations that we used to, but still, you know, that's one thing about Burnaby, between the creeks and streams and the lakes, you know, the amphibian health, there's still quite a variety. I wouldn't say there's the same number, obviously, that there was, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, and it's really up in the air the extent to which climate change will affect amphibians. I think they're uh, uh, particularly vulnerable. Uh, but yeah, these, these little waterways, and especially this creek, all the way around, from, from insects to amphibians to fish to larger wildlife, uh, the, di the diversity in this stream is quite amazing. Yeah, then that was, uh, and I've heard those same stories, and the, uh, uh, those, those species are still there, but whether they're there in the same abundance is really open for debate. The one thing I will say, though, Burnaby has fared much better compared to other cities along those lines, and the one reason is, once again, 25% of our city has been set aside as parkland, and most of our waterways has been protected. So that in itself has helped uh, along those lines. And one of the bigger historical question, um, or more Burnaby Lake than, than the stream, um, was it always a cool, real lake? And some people say it was really more of a marshy swamp before the dams went in. So do you have any sense of how lake-like it was, say, 100 years ago? It's been, it's always been a shallow lake. The lake has always been there, but I think obviously the dam uh, had an impact in terms of the size of the lake and the depth of the lake. Uh, so the lake, I, I say, would have been smaller, but you read historical records, the lake was there, and you can go back to historical records well before the dam was built, and, and the lake was there. The, um, uh, another point I was gonna, what else did you ask in that regard? Well, I mean, it's sort of related. Oh, I mean, I've heard yeah. people also say that, I mean, in the 50s and 60s, there were plans basically to fill it in, and people said, well, you know, it's not useful. I mean, the recreationalists said, let's dredge it so we can do more boating. And other people said, well, no, it's not to be filling in. Let's just let it fill in. Maybe we can even encourage it along the way so we can build something. That's the point I was going to make. Uh, the lake itself, all lakes fill in over time. The difference, so you get sediment infilling in all lakes. 
But historically, thousands of years ago, if a lake filled in, you know, then the water would end up finding a, another place to kind of deposit, another lake would create. I mean, so infilling is a natural occurrence for all lakes, but it takes thousands of years. For Burnaby Lake, the process was speeded up dramatically because of the amount of development that we had in the watershed several decades ago. Anyway, just to finish that off about the lake, from my perspective, I think the issue was I totally understood the intention to dredge it, but I wanted to ensure it was done in an environmentally appropriate manner. That, uh, uh, you know, there are mud flats that have ecological value. I appreciate wanting to enhance recreational uh, pursuits like rowing and paddling. I think for some of the, the creeks where they hit the lake to actually deepen them a little bit uh, to provide a cooler source of water down low in the midst of summer was a good idea too. So, you know, I, I think there was a really happy medium that was struck uh, and I must admit I'm an avid paddler and to think that I can go down to Deer Lake or to Burnaby Lake and I, I paddle along Burnaby Lake and I duck up Still Creek and I paddle, uh, uh, I mean, to do that close to my home right in the middle of the city, I love. So Burnaby Lake, once again, like Deer Lake, great environmental attributes, but great recreational value, too. Uh, anyway, so I guess that uh, I have to end. <laughs> but, but anyway, I wish you all the very best this summer, and I'll be here on occasion. I hope I run into you uh, and look forward to seeing you, if not before, uh, on River State. Definitely. Thank you. River's Day, it's Sunday, September 29th, as you were told earlier. There's going to be a, an array of activities here, all the usual things that go on. But in addition to that, there's going to be a, a children's fishing pond. There'll be a, interpretive activities. We'll have, lots, we'll have some live raptors here. Uh, we'll have the Coyote Watch program. There'll be a, uh, some special activities with kids. And actually, we're still talking about yeah. things we can add. <laughs> and, we're, and we're certainly open to ideas, too. Yeah. That some of you may have. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to thank um, Mark for his wonderful talk. I think oh, we all learned amazing. a lot. And we'll be working closely together over the next few months. I think there's a real interest here among staff volunteers um, in in seizing this opportunity to interpret our creek and to interpret environmental history on the site. I can see a lot of different opportunities, whether it's tours or school programs. Um, World Rivers Day, we would love to make this a regular event. So I'm sure we're gonna see more of Mark. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.